Welcome to our service here at First Baptist Church, Dawson Creek. I'm Pastor Terry, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch our service. Grab your coffee, join us for a time of music, Bible reading, and thoughts to help you get through this next week. In today's message, we're going to continue to look at the names of Jesus. This week, it's Alpha and Omega and Wonderful. We call Jesus Wonderful because of all he has done for us in the world. The biggest wonderful is that Jesus still loves each one of us and wants us to love him. Next week, we'll be sharing communion again, so have your bread and juice ready. Continue to join us each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together and to share your words and your ideas and your thoughts and your love. Lord, I do pray that you will guide the music and the words that they be yours. And Father, that we will do our best for that. Be with us now and just give us a great time together. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Barb Monroe, and she's going to be used, doing the song, How Great Thou Art, Please Sing Along.
Thanks, Barb. Isn't that an incredible song? I want you all to be able to sing the song with sincerity and excitement. God is great and awesome and worthy of our praise and prayers. Today, the message is on another set of names in our series on the wonderful names of Jesus. We will look at the names Alpha and Omega and Wonderful. As we've been glancing at these names for Jesus, I hope that it has spurred you on to dig deeper into God's word, to look at these names and look at who Jesus was, and to find out how it affects your life going forward. God is waiting for you to understand him, even more than you do right now. Dig into his word and discover a new excitement over the love of God and what he has for you. So let's go do some digging. We will start with Alpha and Omega. Smith's Bible Dictionary tells us that Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, and it is used in the Old Testament and the New Testament to express the eternity of God, and is including the beginning and the end. We start into God's word in the book of Isaiah, where the prophet is telling the people of Israel what God wants them to hear. Isaiah 44, 6 this is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Think about that. Jesus is saying he is the King and Redeemer. He is the Lord Almighty, which we've already looked at in a previous uh, Sunday. He's the first and the last. He's at the beginning and he's at the end. And apart from him, there is no God. Did you get that? Apart from Jesus, there is no God. It's important that we understand that. The prophet Isaiah understood it. He got, he got this message directly from God and he passed it on to the people. And that's what our job is. Everyone who believes in Jesus is supposed to pass on what God tells them to the rest of the people and to share that love that Jesus has for everyone that I mentioned at the beginning. It's important that we do that. Now we're going to go all the way back to the, the book in Revelations, the back of the Bible, where the Apostle John sees a vision, and God speaks to him and tells him to write it down. And you have to understand, John, he's an apostle at Jesus' time. And what he saw was stuff that he could not explain well. It was beyond their imagination. It was beyond what they had understood at that point. And he tried to do the best he could to help people understand. But there was some of it, some of it that he got totally right and that he totally understood. And when it came to God, he understood God. But let's look at Revelations 1.8. Here John is quoting Jesus. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. There's that word Almighty again. Jesus wanted us to understand there was nothing bigger than him. 
nothing more powerful than him. That God is an awesome God who is over all and can, and can completely take on anything. He is the Alpha and Omega who was, who is, and who will be the Almighty. Jesus was the beginning of our world, is a part of it now, and will always be here with us. When we go up to verse 17 in chapter 1 of Revelations, we have John in front of Jesus. And this is what he says. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Again, here's Jesus saying that he's here from the beginning of time to the end of time. He's not been away. He hasn't gone missing. He's not been absent. He's a God who is always there for us. He's always around. And that he will look after us. He said to John, do not be afraid. Don't fall down. Don't worry about it. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help you, to lift you up, and to carry you. And that's what Jesus wants us to get. He's carrying love for us. He wants us to know that he will forever be beside us. And that we can run this race in life trusting him to be right there running it with us. In Revelation 2, verse 8, we have John writing down what Jesus is telling him to do again. And this time it's a letter to a church. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Now why would you think he would open a letter up like that? He first of all says, I'm that one, the first and the last, reminding them of what he's been talking about. All through the Bible, it's given, it's given us words about this and, and prophecies about it and statements about it. And then he says, who died and came to life again. You might think, well, that's just okay because, well, Lazarus did the same thing. Lazarus died and came back to life when Jesus brought him and some of the other people he brought back to life. So what's the difference? What's the big thing? The difference is those people all died again. Physically, they died again. Jesus never did. He rose up and beat death, and he's never going back to it. And what he's offering us through that death and resurrection is the means to live forever with him. And we need to be looking at that and grabbing a hold of it. In Revelation 21, 6, we have John's vision of heaven with Jesus sitting on a throne. And here's what he writes. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. If you remember your Bible stories, Jesus, as he was walking through the, the countryside and doing different things, he had many times where he talked to people about this water of life, springs of living water, and that he could give that to us. He's reminding us of those lessons. And he reminds us that he wants to bring life to everyone who asks for it. That's why it says, for him who is thirsty, I will give to drink. You have to want it. For people who have no desire to know who God is, who have no desire to, to look into it, there's nothing there. But once you start to thirst, once you start to say, there's something I need, and right now in this, this time of life in our world, the way it is, I can't see how a person wouldn't want to know if there's a, if there's a better possibility there. If there's a chance that I could have a life after this physical life. I want to look at it. I want to taste it. I want to find out if it's real. And I think we need to do that. Revelations 22, 13. And now we have an angel quoting Jesus. And the angel says, this is what Jesus said. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There in one sentence, he's put all three of those Couplets, or whatever they call that word, couplets, together. 
Alpha and Omega, first and last, beginning and end. Telling us that he truly is forever. He truly is the one that we can trust, that we can look to for answers, for help, for support, and just to talk to. He confirms that. Well, I want to look at another idea of God and of Jesus. In John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, very famous verses. A lot of people have read it. In fact, when you first start to look at who God is and trying to figure out where Jesus fits into it, people will send you to John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, or maybe even a few more verses. But here's the first two verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the, God, the Word was God. And I want to encourage you, carry reading on. Go on from two on and read if you want to. But I want to stop at just one. I meant to do that, sorry. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is Jesus. Jesus is the Word, and He is God. And he's been together all this time. We're to learn from the, that, from the word every day. We take God's word, the Bible, and we read it. And it's all about Jesus. That's why they call him the word. It's his life that we're talking about. And we're learning about. And we need to follow. I don't know how to excite you better than to say, give it a try. Learning about Jesus is probably the best learning you'll ever do. I was reading an article uh, just yesterday about what is so different about him. Why is Jesus so different? Why in 2,000 years since he walked on this earth do people still talk about him? Why is the Bible the best sold book in the world? And there's that electronic interference again. And why, why do we have this man who, even though he wasn't rich and famous and he wasn't powerful and, and majestical like the princes and the, and the kings, he was just a carpenter. And he walked amongst the people. And yet, we can't quit talking about him. And people keep looking for him. Well, one of the reasons is that we can be confident of who he was. In Philippians 1, verse 6, it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God made us. I believe that. He created mankind. And he had a plan for how we could walk with him and have a relationship with him and be with him all the time. We chose, as a nation and a country and a world, to walk away from him and to go find our own way and to struggle through all ups and downs by ourselves. And yet he says here, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God's not finished with us yet and he's willing to let us wander around in our own world, but he has a plan that he would love to help us follow so we can have the best and that we can become the best human beings we could be. And we could have that strong relationship with him. It's important that we do that. It's important that we, we look for that. There is no doubt that Jesus states that he is God. There is no question that Jesus states he was the beginning and he, was, he will be the end. The question that we have to deal with from Alpha and Omega is when will we believe and join Jesus? got a joke for you. A minister waited in line to have his car filled with gas just before a long holiday weekend. The attendant worked quickly, but there was many cars ahead of him. Finally, the attendant motioned him toward a vacant pump, and he said, Reverend, I'm sorry about the delay. It seems as if everyone waits until the last minute to get ready for a long trip. The minister chuckled and said, I know what you mean. It's the same in my business. You know, there's a long trip coming called eternity. And we either get ready for it, or it just happens, but it's coming. Do you want to be prepared? Or do you want to just take what comes? I like to think that we can be prepared for that. And that's what God promises. 
Now we go to the second name, the one I get excited about, the one they call Wonderful. It's in the it's in the title of the theme that I'm showing right now, the wonderful names of Jesus. It's a way you can explain who he is. He's wonderful. But it's also to create a different feeling about who he is and what he is, this Jesus that we follow. Webster's New World Dictionary defines wonderful as marvelous, amazing, very good, excellent. That's what wonderful means. So when we talk about wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, wonderful Prince of Peace, we're talking about a marvelous, amazing, excellent thing. Prophet Isaiah in verse, chapter 28, verse 29 gives us some of that. All this also comes from the Lord Almighty, wonderful in counsel and magnificent in wisdom. Think about that. Jesus, wonderful in counsel. When he talks to you, it works. I don't know how many of you have ever gone to a counselor, but sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't, and it really depends on that relationship. Well, here's a wonderful in counsel person that we can go to, and it will work, and it builds on that relationship. And then magnificent in wisdom. He's wise. He has the entire truth of God to share with us. I think if I was going to go looking for wisdom, I'd go to the person who wrote it, the person who made it, rather than somebody who's tried to figure it out along the way. Go first to God, and then how people look at it. Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary defines wonder as first it signifies a divine act or a special display of divine power. Second, the word represents a sign from God or a token of a future event. I like that. Whenever Isaiah talks about Jesus, whenever the prophets talk about Jesus, whenever the, the disciples talk about Jesus, whenever John in his visions talks about Jesus, it's about the signs that come along with it. And it's about that divine act that we have. Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I used that same verse last year because we were looking at a different names there. But I want to concentrate on this Wonderful Counselor again. Jesus has so much compassion, so much love for you that you can go to him and he will hear what you're saying. And he will know and understand what you're feeling. He's a wonderful counselor. Ravi Zacharias in his book, Can Man Live Without God? states, the older you get, the more it takes to fill your heart with wonder. And only God is big enough to do that. I kind of like that. The idea that as we get older, we've seen it all. Nothing surprises us. We, we, we get kind of hardened to the craziness and the excitement and, and, and things like that. And we just become okay, but not crazy. God comes along and says, I want to show you something new. He puts things in front of us that just make us realize we haven't even seen half of what the world has, half of what God can do for us, the things he wants us to learn. Man, just, just watch around you. Right now we have, we have a, an epidemic that's, that's causing, or a pandemic, that's causing the streets to be empty, and now we're all filling them up again, but they were empty. And what happens? God's natural creations, animals, start wandering back into the streets. We've seen videos of, of different animals walking around the streets, people trying to, get the, to watch them, and they, they get excited about watching them and the energy that's in these animals. Don't you think that God wants us to be like that too? Don't you think that, that he came along to, to give us that so that we would always have something new, something that we could be excited about, to remind us of what it's like to be fresh in an idea? 
I think this whole, this whole shutdown is causing a lot of people to be creative. Their brains are starting to work again. We were so busy, we were in our routines, and we just had no room for creativity. And now it's coming out. The older you get, the more it takes to make you feel wonder, but God is big enough to do that. Ravi has it right on that one. On, in Psalm 77, verse 14, it says, You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Think about that. All through the Old Testament, God did miracles. Major things. Big things. And then in the New Testament, he didn't do that as much. He left that up to the people to do it. Jesus did miracles. His disciples did miracles. You had to be tapped into the power of God. You had to believe. You had to have that faith. But they could do miracles. I still think there's miracles happening today. We just don't want to call them that. We want to explain them away. We want to scientifically come up with the answer of how that happens. We want to emotionally put it in there. But a miracle is still a miracle. Something miraculous that happens that can't be explained all the time. That creates excitement and wonder. That wonder of God. The wonderful Jesus that we know. That wonder. George Beverly Shea, who's a, a very accomplished singer, he's quoted as saying this. There's the wonder of sunset at evening. The wonder as sunrise I see. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. We call Jesus wonderful because of all he has done for us in this world. The biggest wonderful is that Jesus still loves us even when we wander off, even when we do things wrong, even when we become sinners. He loves us and wants us to love him. He's allowing us that opportunity to be thirsty and take a drink of the water that he provides. It's important that you understand that. We do not need to Skype or Zoom or FaceTime or any other electronic method to talk to God. He's right beside you with no need for social distancing. God is always available and desires to continue or start a relationship with you. He's all about that relationship. He's all about being a counselor for us, being a shepherd for us, a protector. I get excited when I think about Jesus and what he can do for us if we just allow him to. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. They're talking about the Israelite people there. Because that was God's chosen people back then. But you know what? Jesus came and died on that cross and was resurrected and created this wonderful gift of salvation, being saved from that sinful death that we should have, so that all of us, not just the Israelites, became his chosen people. If you take on that thirst and you drink of his water and you accept him, for who he is and what he is, you become part of that chosen people, that royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people belonging to God. But then you are to declare the praises of him who called you out of that darkness that you were living in and into his wonderful light. And there's that word wonderful again. He is a wonderful light. The light of God shines for us at all times. You cannot see because of darkness surrounding you. When you're in terrible times, you cry out to Jesus and he will come into your presence and when he comes into your presence, it lights up your life. Things change. The, the heavy burdens don't seem so heavy. The, the, the path that you can't see, all of a sudden you can see. A way out. A chance to get above things. It's important that we understand how wonderful God is and how wonderful Jesus is. And that's why we call him wonderful. The light of God is going to light up our presence. Jesus is wonderful. 
when we take a look at Alpha and Omega and Wonderful, and we put them together, and we have this wonderful God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is there from the beginning of time to the end of time, and his whole purpose for us was to have a relationship where we could be with him, and we could be loved by him, and we could love him, and we could have a great relationship together. That's never changed. He loves you. No matter what your situation is, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, he loves you. And like on that cross, at the last minute, when the guy sitting beside him on the cross, the other cross said, Lord, I want to be with you. No matter how bad he was, Jesus said, good, come along. He was thirsty, and he took a drink, and he followed and believed. And Jesus said, amen, you're part of my family. Jesus is wonderful. He's Alpha and Omega. And I want you to remember that. It's all for you. Barb's going to bring us a song called Everlasting. Please sing along.
To close, I have a poem I want to read to you. It's an unknown author. I couldn't find the author, but it was given to me many, many, many years ago. It's called I Refuse. I refuse to be discouraged, to be sad or to cry. I refuse to be downhearted, and here's the reason why. I have a God who's mighty, who's sovereign and supreme. I have a God who loves me, and I am on his team. He is all wise and powerful. Jesus is his name. Though everything is changeable, my God remains the same. My God knows all that's happening, beginning to the end. His presence is my comfort. He is my dearest friend. When sickness comes to weaken me, to bring my head down low, I call upon my mighty God. Into his arms I go. When circumstances threaten to rob me of my peace, he draws me close unto his breast, where all my strivings cease. When my heart melts within me and weakness takes control, he gathers me into his arms. He soothes my heart and soul. The great I am is with me. My life is in his hand. The son of the Lord is my hope. In his strength I stand. I refuse to be defeated. My eyes are on my God. He has promised to be with me as through this life I trod. I'm looking past all my circumstances to heaven's throne above. My prayers have reached the heart of God. I'm resting in his love. I give God thanks in everything. My eyes are on his face. The battle's his, the victory mine. He'll help me win the race. Unknown. Go through this week knowing that God is with you. Look for him, thirst for him, and go see if he can't make your week brighter and lighter and more exciting. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.